Welcome to politicseastasia.com. My name is Florian Schneider and today I'm talking to my colleague Dr. Russ Glenn here at Leiden University who is an expert in international politics, particularly in foreign policy of modern China. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the recent changes and shifts in Chinese foreign policy and military strategy that's been in the news so much. And then the Pentagon has also recently uh, published a uh, defense paper on this. Uh, and I'm wondering how, how you feel uh, about uh, the, the way that the Chinese government, for instance, is framing the first two decades of the 21st century as a strategic window of opportunity to expand national power. Uh, well, what does that mean? What does national power mean in this context? Uh, so national power uh, generally just means all the different ways or means by which a state or a country tries to achieve its goals. Um, and normally we think of this um, in different elements, kind of the economic side of things would be how, you know, the, the GDP would be how strong a country is economically. Military side would be something like how many aircraft carriers or nuclear weapons they might have. But it also involves things like technological level um, and the level of influence and kind of culture and things like that. A secondary consideration that sometimes we don't always take into uh, um, consideration is the, the things that uh, like geography and resources and populations, right? And most of the time we don't try to quantify these into one grand index, one grand metric, like uh, uh, and, and say these things all add up to this. But that's exactly what the Chinese Communist Party has tried to do. Uh, in the 90s and 2000s they tried to create a metric called the Comprehensive National Power which was just that. They would plug all these different elements into a computer and come out with a, a number that said China is this strong, and in 2020 it'll be this strong, and other countries will be this strong. All right, and uh, how, how is China faring on its own index so far? I think it's, uh, it's doing okay. In some ways it's doing quite well, and in some ways it's not doing quite as well. Um, the first part, you know, China has certainly risen up in the world quite a lot. The economy's growing. Uh, quality of life is increasing in a lot of ways. Economic interconnection is increasing in a lot of ways. But the other thing is we have to remember the second aspect of this strategic window um, in that it's, it's not only a chance for China to rise up, for China to increase its comprehensive national power as much as possible, but it has to do it while not angering the rest of the world, especially the U.S. It has to do it while not making the international environment more difficult. Um, and it's on that part that I think is a little less set. Um, I mean, internationally, we've already seen that China's rise has engendered some concern from the U.S., in terms of its pivot to Asia, but also maybe even more troublingly throughout the East Asian region with Japan and on all these states around in the South China Sea um, kind of rearming and, and, and getting more involved in, in being worried about this. Domestically, um, there's another big consideration in that there's some problems that we, we don't often consider involving China um, that have arisen throughout its rise, things like uh, massive environmental degradation, rising inequality, and great injustice. Okay, but these are all issues that cost money, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think one of the concerns, not just internationally, but also for those who look at domestic uh, developments in China, is how much the Chinese government is spending on, on military developments. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, if I'm not mistaken, it's about 100 billion US dollars. Yep. Uh, and that's uh, only the, the official number, it's right. a sort of conservative estimate. Um, and critics, um, scholars who've, who've looked at these numbers say it should actually be probably twice as much. Mm -hmm. Um, so how do you see these numbers, both in, in, its, in a domestic context, but also in international comparison? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, the numbers are big, certainly, but um, I think some of the concern over it isn't warranted. It's been a little overblown uh, in many ways. Um, the thing here is that China's economy has been growing very quickly, right? But China's military uh, expenditures have been growing apace with the economic growth. So. As the GDP has gotten bigger, the military gets the same slice of the pie. Um, the, the military has not been prioritized. We're not seeing a, a, gr a greater growth in military um, budgets than we would then compared to the, the economy, for example. So I don't think it's fair to say that China's prioritizing military modernization over economic growth, for example. And when we look at the international sphere, it's even less, um, even less of an outlier, you can say. Right? So China's the second largest military budget in the world. but you know, the U.S. is five times larger, almost maybe even a little more, um, at, at $680 billion a year. Um, and on a percentage basis, China is only 10th. So as a percentage of GDP, China's military spending is at about 2%, which is, puts it at 10th as compared to the U.S., which is at about 4 to 4.5%. So overall, I mean, it's something to keep an eye on, um, but I think the absolute numbers are not the big question. It's more a question of what's happening. How is that money being spent and, and what's it actually being put to do?
Okay, but when we look at things like, for instance, the 2009 uh, PRC anniversary, which mm -hmm. included a large military parade, you yep. see all this military equipment uh, being driven down uh, uh, Tiananmen Square. Yep. Uh, so the money does go somewhere, uh, and it's uh, for the Chinese government that actually argues that you know both the conventional weapons and the nuclear weapons arsenal, which is substantial, um, that, that these all serve a, you know the purpose of peaceful development, which is one of those core uh, elements of the foreign policy strategy. But isn't that hypocritical? I mean, isn't that just uh, a euphemism in a way? Uh, to call these weapons tools of peaceful development. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that entirely depends on your standpoint. Um, you know, for for us in the West, or for Japan, or for maybe Taiwan especially, um, it, it, it looks very threatening to have this increasingly capable Chinese military. All these Chinese missiles, for example, look really dangerous. But from the perspective of the Chinese national leadership, or maybe even the Chinese people, um, maybe they see this military modernization as something that is keeping them safer, for example, something that is protecting China's national interests, right? I mean, just to, to play devil's advocate here for a second, no country with nuclear weapons has ever been successfully invaded, right? I mean, would, would the UN have, um, have, have invaded Iraq in the early 1990s if, if Saddam had still had a functioning nuclear deterrent? Would NATO have gone into Libya uh, if Gaddafi hadn't forsworn nuclear weapons? You know, and I'm not trying to be difficult or trying to be controversial with this. I just, I mean, I think that beyond the question of, of moral good or whatever else, we just need to look at the fact that it, it's, it does depend. Your perspective on peace and security does depend on, on where you're looking from. The bigger question in my mind is that this phrase, peaceful development, or this idea of peaceful development, the problem as I see it necessarily is that China has not done a good job, the Chinese leadership has not done a good job of linking this military modernization and even the economic growth into a larger ideology or larger communicative strategy. And thus, you know, these things like peaceful development or scientific development or harmonious world, these catchphrases that the Chinese government uses, often ring quite hollow because how do you describe it, right? Peaceful development for who? Are we talking about just the Chinese people? Are we talking about the world? We don't know and there's nothing to kind of understand it better. Mm. Uh, I think one of the key rhetorical um, elements mm. in, in, this, uh, in this discourse uh, is uh, the famous Deng Xiaoping quote that gets mentioned a lot, uh, both by the Chinese government, uh, but also by its critics. Uh, so I'm going to just read this to you because I find it um, very interesting and we can talk about it a little bit more. Uh, and this is uh, basically Deng Xiaoping uh, saying that China should observe calmly, should secure its position, cope with affairs calmly, hide its capabilities and bide its time, be good at maintaining a low profile and never claim leadership. Now, I understand why never claiming leadership, might, this last part of the quote, might be something that the Chinese government is emphasizing, um, but what about the, the critics who say, actually, you know, the Chinese government is in fact hiding its capabilities and biding its time and there's, there's something sinister going on. You know, what was your impression? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, I think um, Deng Xiaoping had a knack for, for good quotes. He was pretty good at putting out, putting out memorable sayings. Um, I think this is also kind of like the, the military budget, been overblown a little bit, um, in that, you know, we, we, we look at this and we say uh, that, that maybe China has kind of got this deceptive strategy going forward, but I'm not so sure it's a good idea to distill uh, grand strategy from a political slogan. And it's important to remember the context of when this was first said, right? Deng, Deng first said this phrase, or at least part of this phrase, um, shortly after Tiananmen, when China was really kind of keeping a low profile and was beset on all sides internationally and facing a lot of kind of international criticism. Um, and so maybe in that context, it made sense for, quiet, for, for the Chinese leadership to kind of, you know, keep things down and, and not make a, too much of a fuss. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, how much credence we should put in it overall. Having said that, I do think that the kind of general idea of the quote uh, is still equal to or, or is very similar to China's current grand strategy, right? Um, I think China's current strategy long term and for the last two decades has been to increase its comprehensive national power as much as possible while not making the security environment more difficult, while not angering the U.S. especially, while not making them align against them a la the, the, the Cold War. Um, and I think that that quote kind of a accurately uh, encapsulates that idea, um, but it's important to remember that there's no, you know, stated negative second half of that. It's not like we're going to hide our capabilities and bide our time, and then we're going to take over the world, right? 
It doesn't actually say that, and I, I'm not you know, trying to be naive about the fact that that might be possible, but it's important to remember that this is only the first half of something. Uh, as you say, a lot of this is about perspectives and about you know, different worldviews and mm -hmm. so on, but isn't, that, isn't then using a quote like this, if you're you know, a, a Chinese government official or propaganda expert, isn't that yeah. just shooting yourself in the foot? Because I mean, if the Pentagon is this worried that uh, Chinese foreign policy and, and military strategy is intransparent, mm -hmm. then suggesting that you know, um, Deng's idea of biding one's time and being intransparent, I mean, it, it sounds like that's what it says. So what do you make of that then? Isn't that, yeah, isn't that just disingenuous? Yeah, I, I agree entirely, actually. Um, and I think that a lot of people, a lot of actors in China, whether they be political actors or academics or, or whatever else, uh, are realizing that, you know, and there are alternate translations of that phrase that uh, kind of downplay the deceptive side and translate it differently as to something being more like modest as opposed to we're not hiding our capabilities, we're just not showing them off because, you know, we're trying to be nice or something like that. Um, so those, those translations can kind of phrase it differently and I think it's important to take that into consideration. But this transparency thing in general is a bigger question. Um, you know, the Pentagon and, and a lot of other places have been talking about how China needs to be more transparent for quite a while. And I think that China has been making progress in that. Um, we see the, the, the military budgets now are increasingly transparent. We're seeing more and more uh, have a better understanding, I suppose, of where the money's going and what it's being used for. And you, to some extent, you can see that across the political system and economic system as things get a little more institutionalized. But it's important to remember here, too, that, um, that secrecy is, is a double-edged sword, right? In the same way um, that, you know, we're seeing this now with the Snowden affair in the U.S., that U.S. spying and that kind of secrecy involved in that come back to bite in the ass. Uh, I think, you know, this, this could also be the case for China and the military. While Western militaries or Western observers might not have a good idea of what the Chinese military can do, they also, to a very real extent, do not know the full extent of their capabilities. Right? China hasn't fought an armed conflict since the invasion of Vietnam in 1979, and that did not go very well. Um, you know, and while China's military has modernized a lot since then and changed a lot and changed immensely and, and, and you know, has, has ably looked at the rest of the world and seeing what they're doing and modernized in line with that, um, there's still, you know, they've got these beautiful plans, but as Mike Tyson said, uh, Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> well, the Chinese government is trying to get involved with you know, UN peacekeeping missions and yeah. actually is very, very actively yeah. involved and is collaborating with other actors. And is, is that a way to check whether you get punched in the face? Absolutely. I think that's, um, that's actually, I think that's a good sign in some ways. Um, it shows China is a little more confident uh, in both their military capabilities um, and their political, the kind of diplomatic, they're, they're able to take a step forward and, and, you know, and if something goes wrong, they can learn from it as opposed to feeling that they need to hide everything. Um, you know, we've already seen this with the, the Chinese Navy in, um, helping with anti-piracy operations off the Gulf of Aden, and now we're seeing it in Africa, I think, with China's first, uh, just this week, China's first peacekeeping uh, deployment abroad. Um, and that is, you know, on one way, that's a way to test the military and to, to find out what works and what doesn't. But in another way, it's also um, a, a chance to become kind of a more responsible actor uh, on a, at a global level under kind of international auspices. Yeah, uh, in many, many contexts, this responsibility kind of seems like assertiveness, and I think it, it connects very much with what the Chinese government calls the uh, China threat theories. Mm -hmm. Uh, which you see nicely if you go to you know any kind of airport and walk through the bookstores and see all these China's going to rule the world uh, yeah. book sets. Um, so I, I wonder, um, isn't that exactly what we're seeing now in the South China Sea, for instance, yeah. uh, with uh, increasing attempts to balance against China, to contain China, see this with this pivot to Asia by the US. Mm -hmm. We also have Japan and Thailand and, and the Philippines increasingly working together. Now, that can't really be in the interest of the Chinese government, which is trying to promote the idea that it's, you know, developing peacefully and all that. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, um, you know, I don't think the Chinese government has been particularly successful at combating uh, the China threat theory. As I said before, I think part of this problem is the lack of a kind of coherent ideology or communicative strategy. Um, but also, you know, East Asia in general is, is seeing the, the fastest rise in defense spending of any place in the world right now. Um, some people think by 2020 that the East Asia as a whole will spend more on, on, on the military than North America as a whole, which would be a big change. Um, so overall, I, I don't think that the China threat strategy has been particularly well managed. Uh, 
Um, but I, I think we have to keep a couple things in mind. And, and one is that, you know, while we might see this kind of conflict on the surface and these storms between Japan and China or China and other Southeast, um, uh, South China Sea states, there's also still a deep and growing undercurrent of economic interconnection, of uh, the flow of goods and people, of communication, of some cultural interplays. So it's not necessarily a, a black and white kind of Cold War scenario. Um, and I think that can sometimes get hidden behind the, the heat and smoke of the, the conflict on the surface. Um, the second thing is that we have to, to realize as well that the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese leadership has multiple interests, and sometimes their international face or what, hap what the rest of the world sees will not be the biggest thing that they care about, right? In the South China Sea, for example, um, they might not only, you know, it, it's not only their relationship with Japan that matters, but also maybe economic interests surrounding the South China Sea or in the South China Sea, um, that includes you know, energy and fishing, um, but also things like what the public thinks, what their sentiment is, what what domestic kind of nationalist sentiment feels about it, um, as well as maybe longer term things that we, we don't know yet, right? So it's not just, I think, what we're seeing at the diplomatic freight level, but also that there's a lot of uh, things going on at the domestic level as well. Okay, well, what I'm taking away from this conversation then is that the situation is incredibly complex. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm wondering how how fit we are with our you know, descriptions of China doing this and China doing that mm. and constantly treating China as a unitary actor uh, to actually describe properly what's going on. I mean, um, shouldn't we need you know, other kind of ways of, of discussing this complexity? Yeah, I would say absolutely. That would be a good thing and would add a kind of a much needed perspective on, on studying China um, and, and on reporting on China. You know, we often hear China does this or China does that, and I think knowing that China is an authoritarian state, we kind of assume that the Chinese leadership, or maybe even Xi Jinping himself, has the power to personally change or influence policy or anything uh, at any one point. Um, and while that may be the case in very specific instances, 99% of the time the Chinese political system and, and Chinese governance is just as messy and convoluted and beset by interests and, and differing opinions as any Western political system, sometimes more in many cases. Well, I'm thinking of the South China Sea again, mm -hmm. um, and just the fact that uh, it's not just the Chinese government or you know one arm of the military or so on yep. which is involved, but I mean, just in terms of maritime security, you have at least five agencies, as far as I know, including the uh, one is uh, the China Coast Guard, yeah. uh, which isn't a military organization. And then you have all these private organizations. Um, you know, you have national interest groups. People sail to islands in the East China Sea, for instance. Also, a good example. Yeah. It's a similar. Um, you have media conglomerates who report on this. All this feeds back. Not to mention the internet, uh, public opinion. So, uh, uh, what kind of tools do you use as a scholar to even get to this? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really good question. Um, and I think while we have to simplify uh, anything to a certain extent to be able to better understand it and, and most importantly to communicate it to others, um, I think with respect to Chinese studies, it's particularly important to keep in mind the massive diversity um, in, in both different topics and different regions and things like that. So I would say you need to, to kind of tailor, tailor your tool belt uh, depending on what you're looking at, right? I mean, China is a big country, as we all know. It's got you know 1.3 billion people. Things are very diverse from place to place in a way that I don't always think gets represented well in the West. Um, so, for example, you know, on the South China Sea issue, you would need to have a good understanding of the different groups involved. Um, you'd need to have an understanding of how the military relates to the government. Um, you'd need to understand how the central and local governments relate to each other. Things like that. You know, and here it's one of those things where you just have to you have to dig in and simplify. Um, based on what's most important on that specific topic. Do you use the word party state at all, your party slash state? Mm. Uh, I think you can. It's, um, again, one of these simplifications, right? It's a way to describe China. Uh, the thing is, China's, the China, China's political system um, is dominated by one party, right? The Chinese Communist Party is the de facto Chinese leadership. Um, and a lot of these things that we consider to be state organs or state responsibilities in the West or in other countries around the world are not the case in China. For example, the Chinese military is not a national military. It is not technically China's military. It's technically the Chinese Communist Party's military. And its constitutional privilege or its constitutional uh, responsibility 
is to uphold the Chinese Communist Party, not the Chinese state as a whole, which is interesting, you know, and that, that kind of complexity or that kind of um, focus on the Chinese Communist Party um, is interwoven through all of Chinese government, get governance and government in general. I mean, all state options are actually subordinated to party, uh, party apparatus, even if, even if it looks um, uh, on the surface as if it's a government organ, organ that's doing it, it's actually the Chinese Communist Party that's got the real power behind it. In one way, and this is kind of a simplification, but one way to think about it is that the Chinese Communist Party um, is the decision maker behind the scenes, whereas the state is the implementer, right? So you could think of the Chinese Communist Party as an executive and the Chinese and the, the, the state organs as more making sure what the Chinese Communist Party decides actually happens. So it's, you know, it, these are the, the kind of intricacies of, of studying Chinese politics that you have to keep in mind when looking at different issues. So what do you tell your students when they want to study international relations and how China is rising to power in the world? Or, you know, what, what do you tell them what yeah. to look for? Uh, I think it depends on the topic they're, they're looking at specifically. I tell them to, to get to know the issue um, and to think about what it is that's important for understanding that specific thing. Right? So one example here, when we look at China and Africa or when we look at China's economic interests abroad, um, we know that China is going more around the world. China's getting more involved around the world economically in all kinds of different ways. Um, but one thing that we often see is in the West, when, when China goes into, um, or when a Chinese company goes to the Sudan and, and buys oil blocks or something like that, we often get this kind of spate of newspaper articles about how China is taking over Africa or it's kicking the West out of Africa. And it's, it's presented in this kind of state-state conflict, uh, this very kind of hard-edged thing. But I think that's really you know, not the case um, in the same way that when Dutch Shell uh, goes into Nigeria and buys an oil block, we don't talk about the Netherlands trying to conquer Nigeria anymore, right? Um, and in the same way, it's, it's quite similar to that with, with a Chinese oil company like CNPC or Sinopec going into Sudan to buy an oil block. While these companies are related to the Chinese government, they're state-owned, um, and there are connections. It's also very much more complicated than that in that these companies are most of the time guided by economic interest and economic incentive, just like any other major oil company. And most of the time, I think they actually aspire to be treated like an international oil company, like an Exxon Mobil or a Shell. Right. So when it, sorry, when it comes down to, to looking at, at uh, it guiding or telling my students or helping my students with what to do, I think it really does depend on the specific issue at hand and, and just making sure that you're taking the considerations in that work best through that particular viewpoint. Okay, so basically we should, we should open up the, the grand strategy and actually take a look at what, you know, what that means and, and who's part of it, right? Because sure. not everyone is, I mean, are the large state-owned enterprises part of a grand political strategy? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think the, the question there is, uh, I, I would say the one word question is no. The bigger question is sometimes, in some circumstances, when certain political trends are you know, pushing for that. So a, a small example here, um, a couple of years back, one of the Chinese oil companies released uh, exploration blocks off the coast of Vietnam. And when I say off the coast of Vietnam, I mean like if you look at a map, it's like Vietnam and then they released blocks for, for oil exploration right off the coast, like literally right outside. So it was a little ridiculous. Um, and I am almost certain that the Chinese oil company would never have done that individually on their own economic interests because it doesn't make any sense. It's too risky. It's too kind of inflammatory. But that was probably something guided by the Chinese government. They wanted to make a statement in that particular case or they wanted to make a claim to those particular resources and they acted through the Chinese national oil company. Now that doesn't mean that that oil company is a puppet of the government. It just means that in this case these political interests overrode the economic interests that would normally guide the company. Now, it reminds me a little bit of banking, uh, how banking works in China, and then what's mm -hmm. called window guidance, mm -hmm. uh, where also the Chinese government sits down with banks to talk behind the scenes about what the next strategy move is. doesn't mean that the banks are always acting exactly as the government would suggest, right? So it's, yeah, uh, it's yeah. much more complex than that. Yeah, it's a really good way to describe it. Right. Uh, well, uh, I think it's an exciting time to be studying these things. I can only hope that your students are taking as much away from this as I am doing this interview. So thank you very much, Russ. Yeah, thank you. It was a lot of fun. All right. And uh, you've been watching politicseastasia.com. We will be putting up uh, other resources here online so that you can take a look at the kind of links, at the kind of resources, at the kind of uh, articles that Dr. Glenn has been talking about. Uh, and check in again uh, on this website for more.
uh, information on politics in East Asia soon.